Hi there. Thank you for downloading, listening to, and watching the Lean Into Artcast. This is a show where a couple of visual storytellers get together and take on various topics that tend to cross one's path when you go on this endeavor of communicating with images. We think hard about this stuff, so you will too. My name is Jersey Drozd. I'm a cartoonist and teaching artist, and the other host is named. Uh, hi, I'm Rob Stenzinger. I am a user experience designer, and I uh, make interactive stuff, and I, I teach about that as well. So we're both teaching artists. Um, and uh, I think we're th this week we're going to highlight some of the different ways that our our the art that we teach differs, right? Yeah, I get, sure. You say potato, I say tomato. Kind of <laughs> yeah, essentially, yeah. Like like how what not like how our teaching differs, but like I guess our areas of focus differ because um, we're both kind of okay. I, I guess I should back up real quick. Talking about art sound off. Anybody who's like seen the title of the episode knows this, right? Our art sound off. This thing that we came up with like what six, seven years ago now. Um, it's the seventh year of doing this. Uh, so yeah. Wow. Okay. Yeah, seven. Seven years of doing it, um, where we challenge ourselves and everybody and invite everybody else to play along with this idea of like checking in with an audio journal of your art about your art over the month of November. We tend to do it daily. We don't ask that everybody do it daily and we don't even ask that everybody share right you just do it just for the pure practice of it because practice has a benefit right rob i mean we have this thing called the two minute practice oh huh. uh yeah i'm so pick a thing that a lot about and if and something about it new ways to convey it new insight um doing some kind of repeated effort over time it changes it changes you it, you develop new capabilities um i mean that's not instant or magic or it's ten thousand hours precisely and then you you know get a podcast and a helicopter and i don't know um <laughs> magic happens it's it's but it but there's accretion of experience and, and skill when when you do a thing over, over over time which is why we celebrate with the the two minute practice it's you know what, what we the whole the the audio journaling aspect is so core to the endeavor of lean into art and it has so many other benefits i mean which we'll get into in this in this episode um which which some of the hows and whys and the topics that we tend to, to dig into they are a little bit different i mean there's overlap but I mean, that'd be good to talk about revisit occasionally thematically through this episode is is um, trying to get more specific, even though it's possible to connect these things. I'm listening to your your journal, Jersey, not every episode. It's been tough to keep up this month, but like I'm like, yeah, that, that's really similar to a point I'm making. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. We had we had yeah. this week we had to where I felt like we were both like hitting like the real core of what our philosophy is as teaching artists. And like I could hear us both getting kind of riled up in our in our essays, it, 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 yeah. Um, but anyway, yeah, we'll talk about that. So I, that's that's my cue to hit the music so we can get into. All right, there we go. The music it doesn't matter what the music is. <laughs> <What's> that? <laughs> that's the challenge of the, challenge of the GoBots intro. Uh, it's just it's just a signal that we're now in the main body of the episode for the especially for people who listen to the audio version it's like we try to uh create little signals to let you know in case you're getting that highway hypnosis listening to another podcast with two people talking about art uh so the, the things just changed we're in the topic now <laughs> yeah i suppose we we tend to have this uh you know there's energy in 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 and we get a lot get some excitement in what we're doing but we're not quite to the level of of you know drive you know uh, traffic traffic jam reporting and you know honking and farting and stuff <laughs> so and especially if we did it would be pretty quiet honestly. <laughs> yeah, it, would, it wouldn't be it's 75 and sunny in downtown san diego it'd be it's 75 and sunny in downtown san diego honk honk you know what that reminds me of it's, <laughs> uh <laughs> And, and then we we keep digging and exploring the yeah. Y5 and, and <laughs> San Diego. Um. Anyway, uh, it's it's actually pretty useful to uh, to dig into things in the, in that way. Like, um, what have you been digging into, Jersey, with uh, with your topic? 
this month? Like, cause yeah. you have a topic it's like, so art sound off, we have uh, a series of, of, um, like holder, um, cues and, mm -hmm. Prompts, right? That you can respond to. Prompts are an awesome creative technique to just sort of not face a blank thing and and be off and running. But inherently, we're not using prompts and general journaling and exploring different you know uh, angles of this. Like, like we're both digging into something, mm -hmm. um, which is you know some we do this. So we do a mix of this thing. In, in some years. Um, you know a bit of the the whole like hey what inspired you to you know be an artist and when did you first think of your yourself as you know an, an artist that kind of thing but this is different this is like specific top right yeah yeah well and you inspired this uh you said just throughout this phrase teaching artists edition this year and i was like oh my gosh boom a, a framework was like already in my head the moment you said that like i saw as somebody who is a teacher, I've been a teaching artist for 13 years now, and I have been leading professional development sessions for teachers on how to integrate the comic arts into their curricula for 12 of those 13 years. Right. And I, and I, and I literally, I just, two weeks ago, I just did a like all day session, uh, for, Oh, what was the, I want to say the name, right? It's not that I don't remember everybody. So I don't want to misquote what their name is. Um, yeah, the Kennedy center partners in the education program where I was working with a whole bunch of different, uh, not practicing teachers, but students who are becoming teachers, like on like how, doing exercises on how to integrate the comic arts. So, um, it, it, when, the moment you said that I was like, I have a lot of thought invested in that. And I am certain my original plan was so I'd be like i'm gonna write a, a 30 bullet point list of all the things i could talk about for the month and then i was like oh is it november already like i guess i'm winging it <laughs> but <laughs> but winging it in a way where i'm really dealing with like content and thoughts and reflections that i have spent the over a decade working on and I, I, it doesn't take much to like dig in deep on these things and also i wanted to try to keep my entries under 10 minutes if at all possible and like you know, I noticed that you struggled with the same thing where it's like, when you get me going on a topic, it's like, it's hard for me to talk about this succinctly because I have so much thought invested into this, this principle anyway. So that's all to say that my, um, entries this year are all about being a teaching artist, um, and sort of talking about ideas of things you can do it. If you are just starting out as a teaching artist, like techniques, you can try things to expect you know, sharing some of my experiences. Um, also trying to invite people into becoming teaching artists. And then also trying to sell this idea by saying like, and here's how I have noticed that my work as an, uh, as an artist has been enhanced through being a teaching artist because one of the common, um, I don't want to judge where this th th thought is coming from, but I encounter it a lot. Okay, so the, I'm just going to say the thought out loud and you can apply whatever kind of motivation you want behind it, because I don't know, is they say, well, those who can't teach or, well, if you're a teacher, then you're not really an artist because you have to subsidize it with teaching. I'm like, okay, well, that those two statements aren't true to me. <laughs> so they, they are very um, symbiotic. They enhance one another in a, in, in a lot of ways. And I want to underline that and, and like sort of create some rudimentary map of what to expect in terms of like how your art can change as a result of going out and teaching it to people. So that's the theme for mine. What about your theme, Rob? Uh, okay, cool. Uh, there's, there's so much to dig into when what you I know. Just, just Oh yeah. Started, yeah. We'll give will... overviews first. Then we'll dig down is what okay. I'm thinking. Over, all right. All right. So, <laughs> so, uh, my theme is, uh, something I have been working at for for a long time, which that's an interesting thing in and of itself. When when you are creating and you care about the meta, about the experience of creating, and this is very much in, in twine, intertwined and woven in 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 my in my work and my practice and stuff. So this year I'm exploring user experience design as a mindset, so UX mindset, and uh, because in some journaling that, that phrase came up and I thought, 
there's something here where as soon as you decide, just thinking I'm going to include a wider perspective and have that influence me in what I make, that is a choice. And it literally is just thinking that you will do it and then starting to take action that, you know, helps you support that choice. And it really is like a framing of how you look at problems. So do you make products that, you know, just from the gut and through, you know, uh, command only style collaboration or, you know, what, or is, is it sort of a learning endeavor and how, and, and in all my practice, I mean, this is something that I accidentally stopped doing and then got more intentional throughout my entire career. Um, so, and I keep revisiting it in the last few years during art sound off, I would do well, something about this thing where I'm like, gosh, the tools of user experience, which are stolen from many other disciplines are really useful. Um, and I want to help people pick them up and share them and, um, and, and get those benefits where it doesn't have to be a mystery. Like when you're, when you're creating a website, like how could this be better, more accessible, more use, more usable? It's not just a checklist. It's better than that. If you find a way to really include and have conversations and be affected by the people you're serving and actually who you're working with. Anyway, how do I distill that big idea, the bigness of it into small pieces is yeah. my challenge. And uh, uh, I've been working on it. So a couple of years ago, I said, oh, uh, UX um, as, uh, let's, um, what, what do I call it? Um, uh, UX for all. <laughs> mm. um, and then I said, well, okay, well, I don't know. It, there's something to it as far as once you've picked it up. So what about, what if it's practicing UX? And so now this is just a, um, a progression. So each in the last few years, I've done a roughly 10 episodes of the Polytechnicast that are in this direction. And I'm just trying to dig further into it because um, being user-centered and systemic-minded is incredibly useful all around, not just for your audience, but for who you're working with and working for. That's great. So... Uh, so so now that we've got our umbrellas described, and and also I I think this is another neat thing. Maybe this is something that we could point to the meta of Art Sound Off as a as a project is that I've also two years ago, uh, my Art Sound Art Sound Off entries were the draft of an audiobook about teaching being a teaching artist, like basically trying to build a kit for being a teaching artist. And I feel like that while I haven't gone back and attended to that in any kind of meaningful way, um, I feel like this year is like another draft of it in a more narrative sense in less of an instructional sense and i'm really curious about what would happen if i listen to both of them and see if what i what i can might actually probably pump them all into otter.ai and then see what i can extract out of that in terms of like actually releasing a book about this stuff so another thing about doing art sound off is that it allows you to explore drafts and explore um ways to contain the or rather refine the information so that it can actually exist in a container right it's that's a practice in and of itself yeah. when you're facing a, a kind of a, a a space of knowledge and you you think well how can i describe this it's oh i'm it's so, so in your um reflexes how do you observe your own reflexes how do you observe your own observation and to do that once it's you know you probably have something good there but to do it a few times you probably have now found new avenues and uh words metaphors concepts and all that stuff and that's oh my gosh i mean i'm i'm really i i really believe that i've not a, achieved it but that's what i'm really working for is to get that uh more refined expression of these um, these practices and you mentioned a couple things so going back and looking at your older iterations i think is important i think it can be a grind as far as like well do you do you feel like this is leading to a, a future product or are you really kind of just doing homework and uh i think it's possible to frame that where it seems more appealing than than um like administrative un, uh, like work that doesn't lead to like creative outcomes that are rewarding in and of themselves. Right. Mm. It's, it actually is worth it. 
Uh, because what's funny is you're having that conversation with your past self and you get to see like how you have been thinking about this. So anyway, I, I recommend that. And the otter.ai thing is actually a good technique. If in case you don't know about it, otter.ai, who should be a sponsor of the show. Gosh, I use that service a lot. Um, and it's, it's a automated uh, transcription service. So it's not as good as something that like rev.com. I know we've mentioned that before too, where you have humans or probably cyborgs, right? Humans probably augmented with um, automated tools. I'm guessing, I don't know their process, but like, yeah, Otter does it fully automated. So you throw an audio file at it or you record into it and it just transcribes, boom, you have text. And you can listen at fast speeds. So some things, sometimes when I need to go mining my you know, materials, I will, um, well, I, I'll do a search and I'll find the, the things I want to re-listen to and then read as it's going. You, go, you, you, you put that on a higher you know, speed um, uh, playback setting and then highlight the important things along the way, um, which... Uh, what the heck? So I also has a, have a JavaScript thing that I built where if you, if you, if you open up Chrome and you use the, 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 the console, right? So the, the developer console, you can put in scripts to interact with any page you're looking at. So mm. um, I have a script that will then take all my highlighted text and export a text file. <laughs> Oh man, it's if it's possible to automate, it's always worth automating. <laughs> so what it can happen there is like, oh, um, I what what are my key points? And I'll I'll get some rough thoughts out, and then I'll look back, and I go, oh, this is the best parts of that, and boop, text file, and then I can look at that, and mm -hmm. you know, write an article or do another recording that's a lot more, you know, um clear and you know looks like i really planned it out um a lot better so okay cool I, I i think we got through like some meta and some ways of thinking about how like art sound off can be both like also a product development tool um but uh so and, and i think that's part of your angle which we're going to talk about like what like in the second half of the show like what we're hoping to get out of this year's art sound off but like while we're still thinking about these umbrellas that we're like operating under for our entries this year um i wonder if we could dig into some of the specific episodes and talk about them that with some of the, the essays we've done sure. so far and how do we feel about them so uh you gonna go first since we you, yours is the most recent that we talked about like in terms of the, okay. the umbrella okay so um i mentioned it so in that umbrella of user-centered thinking in a systemic way is incredibly useful um and approachable. I, I, I'm trying to pitch it to different audiences. And so that's like my foundation thing where um, here's, you know, I did an intro episode about UX mindset overall, and then I delved into it for um, one episode for business, separate for software, and then one for designers and one for artists. All trying to say that um, in a way I'm trying on who am I going to really reach toward next when I make, make a workshop out of this, or I, I, um, you know, put an article out on medium.com. Right. And, um, that's, uh, yeah. So digging into those audiences, uh, that I, you know, it's, it's, that's the danger. And, and the stress that I'm facing with this is that I see how generally incredibly useful it is. <laughs> and I know that it's not going to hook and connect and, and, um, be as compelling with any audience by just talking about it generally. So it was important to try the audiences. And then I, uh, I also delved into, well, okay, so now you're open to it. Yay. That's, that's, that's like the initial step. And then it's the whole, well, how do you act on it? And so I did a group of episodes about that talking about, uh, lists are, they're a really powerful tool I use all the time in tons of different ways. They're another, I have, there, there's generalism traps all over in my notes, right? So lists, hey, so what? Everyone does lists and I'm like, exactly. And because here's where they're, they can be useful. And then I, then I delved into listening and reasons to listen. And that actually is sort of a, an extension evolution of the workshop I did earlier this year about uh, listening for um, you know, technology lead and where, where if you're, if you listen like a coach, that's a certain kind of, um, 
uh, mode of being of service to your team and helping people th think through stuff and uh, incredibly powerful, but like, that's not the only mode of listening that I think would, would be helpful for an audience or help you be user centered. So I expounded that to be, you know, you listening to present, to lead to, uh, consult coach or journal. But then, um, what about, um, like one of the powerful areas of lists is, is these groups, these constituencies that as soon as you say, oh, I'm going to make a product, I'm going to make a web comic, I'm going to make a, um, let's see, a utility to help people with their um, creative notes. I don't know, like you have a product idea, but then um, you can really boost your thinking by saying, I'm doing this and it connects to these other audiences. If I acknowledge them and include them in my concept of what I'm working on, I'm going to be making better stuff. So there's, you know, there's your audience, there's your team, there's your organization, there's the world and yourself. All right. That was a, that was one of my favorite ones of this of this year's batch, Rob. I just I feel like that's like something that we just need to hear and internalize and repeat over and over again. It, and it sounds like you could easily drive yourself mad with this idea of considering all the constituencies who are going to interact with your thing and the ways they're going to interact with your thing. Um, and like describing the internal constituencies, the external constituencies and so on. It's just like it's it's so worth thinking about you know and and it and it can improve your thing so much better it's it's like the difference okay to like bring it to my side of the line like like comics it's like i i, I go through this with my students all the time as i do an awful lot of introducing them to the idea of peer review and letting the other people in the room interact and respond to your work and not taking it personally but like looking at it as a gift to help you make the thing better. We all want it to be perfect the first time out. It is rarely so. <laughs> so it, it sometimes it is. I'll accept that there's times when that happens where you like you just like you get lightning in a bottle, as they say. But like most of the time, it's a lot of grinding, and that grinding <laughs> is is better served with information on how it's being reacted to. I, I'm not talking about focus groups, kids. I'm talking about hand it to the other peers in the room and get their feedback and really try to accept it in the mindset of it, they're giving you a gift, even if you don't use it, right? At least you're getting information, right? So like, yeah, this is something that I, I just feel yeah. like, yeah. It, and as somebody who works in a lot of organizations, you know, as a teaching artist, I work with a lot of schools. I work with like different advocacy, advocacy groups. How do we know that we're doing a good job? You know, <laughs> it's, it's yeah. And it's things that, that, um, Again, like if everyone's in, in in a collaboration and being reflect in a reflexive mode, just doing what they instinctually know how to do, it's easy to miss out on some core purposes that maybe are common ground that if you know could be the the voice of a project or something emphasized or just lose out on or forget to 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 include as far as um like well like really reaching out to the particular audience that you really really want to help with the you know the the goals of an organization or what have you. So being, um, yeah. You, so if you take that list and you get a list of each one of those constituencies goals, and then, uh, you can get more intentional about what you're making. And, um, yeah. And it, there's, there's a lot that can go from there because of course, um, that can be a lot of conversations. It's a, it's a lot of, um, you know, potentially extra extra work, but then part of the argument is well, putting in the the acknowledging this is the the next one is a mental model you're working toward, and I'm trying to make tangible the idea that um like you can have a there's always something you're working toward, and whether you're thinking about it on purpose or not, and then the the uh, uh like how how specific and and focused are you where like a sales a person who works in sales is looking to close a deal like what's the thing you're working toward as as an artist that help and and then what's the path to get there what's your map of navigating all the choices and m reducing risk over time and then ending up with a result that you that that is suitable right um and so yeah i don't know if you have reaction to that but no, no, I, 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 that's yes, that is like, and that goes back to the earlier one, this idea of like, like understanding what the, all the needs are helps you build the map and building the map doesn't mean that you're insuring against the future. It means that you have 
redundancies and and plans in case you know something things do go sideways right this is something i talked about in mine if, we, uh, if i can we, we've done a lot of overlapping with our our uh topics Rob. we have totally yeah uh, i don't mean to be uh stealing your thunder with uh oh no getting into all the detail with this because yeah we've, we've totally covered similar ground yeah it's and, funny because... so like one of the one of the things i talked about in one of my plunder punch dailies was this idea of improvising with pre-designed bits and this is based on an observation you made years ago when i was talking about like the way i teach my classes and you said oh yeah so really you, you just like have like a bunch of modules that you just have in a bag and you like look for where they fit and you plug them into the moment when you need it so you can walk in without a really clearly defined plan, but still have a very structured and uh, purpose-driven and objective-driven session. I'm like, yeah, wow, that's a great way of phrasing it. And so like when you, when you think about having a map, the map is there so that you have redundancies and backups and, and you've outlined the dependencies. So when something goes sideways with this part over here, it's like, okay, well, quickly, we got to figure out how to solve this problem. Well, let's look at what the objective or what the needs are for this particular part of the the organization that i'm working within right now right which and, I, yeah. that is part of the map like <laughs> the idea so the 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 putting the map to use in in this like how i'm working to describe it and i don't know if i've arrived there yet but is that um well it, it goes to the my, the last one on my list, which is active learning, being certain enough and to keep moving forward where you're, you're accepting that you, you have a process, you trust it and stuff will happen that you didn't anticipate, even though you're like, you've done this before. It's bringing new stuff into the world. Um, it's not that we're, we're all able to just will it into existence with no, you know, bumping into anything else, you're, you're, you're encountering people and constraints, all kinds of stuff. So like putting the, putting the model to use is, is a, you know, you need to have a, a way of looking at the, the creative process to say that, well, okay, uh, we're going to adapt as we go. Stuff will go sideways. How sideways is, is a question. What stuff is the, is a question, but like you can be prepared to, to, to just navigate a creative process. Um, and trust you'll come out on, on the other side. And I think a lot of, um, and that's, that's one of the, the things I probably got a little, um, amped up with. Yeah, you did. <laughs> it's good. It is good. Um, yeah. And then of course, with all of this, it's, uh, uh, like an element of, of all of my workshops. Now I'm trying to, to embrace the idea of, and, and well model the behavior that stuff can go wrong in a really bad way like you you can like when you're when you're in a position of creating and the, have the privilege of putting products into the world you may uh you have a you have power and you might be misusing that power and i wanted to to address that and uh, like like where can stuff go wrong is uh, is sometimes a placeholder in my workshops but uh in this i called it misunderstanding use of ux ux's power yeah, that was that was one of my favorite ones too. Cause that one I think it dropped the same time as I was talking about the respecting the power dynamic in the classroom. And I think we were both like really talking about something that was like fundamental to like our worldviews through this topic that we enjoy so much, you know? And and I, I think I started mine off by saying something to the effect of like, I think in examining this topic, um, I've discovered why being a teaching artist is so um, appealing to me. And that's because it's so harmonious with this idea of the most powerful person in the room has to be the most gentle person in the room. And then I was like, at, at the moment I said it, I caught myself. I was like, actually, that's you bringing that to teaching heart, teaching arts, because I've met teaching artists who walk into the room and want to be the sage on the stage and say, all right, everybody simmer down, be quiet until we get through this bit, then we can move on to the other bit and we got to get the work done. And then I, and I sit in the other side of the room going like, Oh, oh why, why, why are you making everybody, uh, follow along with your energy levels? You're supposed to respond to our energy levels. <laughs> so anyway, different, like, so yeah, yeah. And I, I really enjoyed the, your episodes on that where, um, and I don't know, I think, yeah, I don't, I don't know when I listened to yours and when I made mine because it's a kind of a blur, right? Yeah. As the month is going by, <laughs> but, um, it's 
it's totally that that yeah how, how you're using your your power and mm. uh, and try to try to be intentional with it and and adds add uh, really you know constructive principles that really help you get to where you you know uh, set yourself up to deliver the thing you believe in delivering why don't, why don't you like so i've i've uh, so i've explored what i've been sharing a lot like, like let's dig deeper into like so your essays on being a teaching artist like mm -hmm. um you mentioned a few along the way but well yeah so i mean i i started off with a um, so i was looking at this i instinctually entered in with sort of the same mindset that i enter into a classroom with which is okay job one is risk the minute well, actually in a physical classroom job one is assess the room figure out who i'm working with here Right. Let's let's get some feedback from them. Tell me your name. What do you like about drawing? What do you like about comics? Like get us a, a feel for what's the experience level, what's the fluency, what's the confidence level in the room. But can't do that in a podcast. So the next step is risk diminishment. Let's make this as approach. Here's how I talked myself out of doing this thing. You know, I was presented with the opportunity to do it. the inner narrative, the, the, the critical voice that came in and told me all the reasons why I wasn't cut out to do it. And then, and then building on that, I'm like, okay, well, let's think about some other things that you might, that might feel like big jobs. And let's point out how they don't have to be big jobs. Like, so I did episode 265, which was like, you don't have to show up as a genius orator, right? There's something really nerve wracking and frightening about public speaking and and when you're, and and I even made the comparison, like sometimes when you get in front of a big audience, like if you're in like a, a auditorium and like the lights are low, you can't see them, right? It's still frightening. It's still really nerve wracking. But when you're in a room with like 15 people who are looking right at you and you get that instant feedback of whether or not they're engaged, like I've, I've had people fall asleep in my classrooms before, you know, <laughs> it's, it's, it's a. happen like, like that could be incredibly demoralizing and actually how how you know nerve-wracking that was and so you think well i gotta go in there and i gotta be this dynamo this Susie orman level public speaker i gotta go in there you know like jane mcgonigal and just or or uh oh, oh gosh what's neil gaiman's uh that why am i blanking on her name the art of asking right oh, um Amanda Connor, right? And no, Amanda, Amanda Palmer. Palmer. Amanda yes. Palmer. Yeah, I got to go in there with her level of personality yeah. and presence. And now that woman can electrify a room, right? Um, no, you don't. You because this is this is skill building. And yep, you got to bump into the walls, right? So like I, I, you know, and I even talk about like different ways that you can like get some experience doing public speaking for free, you know, in really low risk ways. So things like that, but then, but then I've, I've gone into like some more practical approaches, like, okay, well, and this goes to something you were talking about with your essays, Rob is like, I, I did one on lesson, plan, lesson plans. Um, but specifically, um, you can't get too specific. Right. And this is like something I really struggled with, with lesson plans is like, because I see how it's all interconnected. So you can't say, well, I'm going to teach a panel layout. Well, that's like four hours. I'm gonna teach a panel. Okay, well, how do I break it down even more specifically? Well, let's talk about sequence, right? We're not gonna talk about the interrelatedness of the panels on the page. We're not gonna talk about how different uh, aspect ratios change the way it feels. We're not gonna talk about panel border, no panel border. Maybe, maybe we'll talk about that in the moment in the classroom, but for the purpose of this lesson plan, all we're going to talk about is how the order of images changes the understanding of the images. We're not going to talk about moment choice. We're not going to talk about looking up and looking down. We're not going to talk about like light and dark and negative space. All that stuff is out the window. All we're talking about is sequence, right? And it's like getting to that level of specificity is really challenging, especially if you have a lifetime of thinking about this stuff, right? And it's, it's, it's very, um, it's, I think that that part too is a lifelong endeavor is like finding a way to achieve that specificity. I also, I think there's a very different circumstance when you are prepared to provide something in a interactive live setting yes. yep. versus uh, encapsulating it in a um, it's, it, it lives on its own. It is time shifted and what have you. So like a downloadable workshop, this thing you're describing haunts me and it's super difficult. 
um, walking into a room to, to, to facilitate a workshop. Fantastic. Yeah. Can go anywhere based on what people are, are, are feeling and needing and thinking and, and responding to, but ugh, the up, the, the upfront specificity is, um, is really challenging for me. It is, it is. But okay, so here's another layer I'd put on. I don't know if this went into the Thunder Punch Daily. Is that even if let's let's suppose that we did this lesson plan on sequencing the sequence of images, odds are even if this is something you have thought about, you probably haven't given it that much of your attention for an hour. So even if we take out all the extra context and really just focus on that one thing, the fact that we're focusing on it is creating uh, an intent to give attention in a way to that idea that we have heretofore not done. Um, so even in a pre-recorded thing, I would suggest that like, yeah, even as that is a, a specific thing, I bet there's going to be people, there's going to be people who show up and go like, oh, I was hoping for more. But I bet there's going to be people who show up and be like, I never thought about it that hard before in my life. You know, sequence is weird. So, and what our brains do with, with sequenced images is super weird. So, um, but then, okay, so here's the other thing. It's like in, in like a you know, lesson plan, you build in what's called reflections, right? So you put in a section at the end of your lesson plan that says like, okay, here's some questions that you can propose to the students to help them broaden and um, consolidate or own their learning of that experience. And so you could point to, here's some other directions you could go with it and think about how it connects to this, that, and this. Because I I see those connections. I'm asking you to see if you can see those connections. So you could you could bake that into a pre-recorded thing. I think, um, but it I, I'm not. That's not to diminish how hard it is. It's super hard. I mean, having I've written a lot of lesson plans in my life, and it's it's really challenging to winnow it down to what's what's the core thing that we're learning here. So, yeah, and. Uh, it's doable. I don't mean to say that it's not, um, and, and, and it's something that I have practice in, but like in some, sometimes I, I, um, that's, well, I mean, that's one of the reasons to, to be unpacking. And right now, just the process of saying, I have a focus and I'm going to record thoughts on it. The focus is a generating sort of thing that lets you connect the um the relationships among among ideas and all of a sudden now you have um like you've examined a possible narrative for providing that information and that um yeah that l lets you maybe discover and or test a lesson plan so you have your intentionality but then i guess in a way the the all the awesome connections that you may see and care about in a particular topic they're kind of uh, like to me, it, like I can pick I, like right now in my head, I'm picturing those are all um, voices as I'm trying to walk, find and walk a path. And they're all like, hey, come over here. Look at this. This is awesome. I'm like, I know it's awesome. I'm working. I'm going. Th this yeah. is my path right now. I'm yes. doing this workshop. And it's yeah. like, well, you know, uh, let's see. What about um, what about doing some practice with. Um, you know, doodling for wireframing or what, you know, what if you did some persona stuff here? Like I'm not focusing on journey maps right now. Come on. Yeah. But you see the real connections of like, well, Hey, you know what? Journey map is pretty great. When you start, when you prime the activity by having great, um, like practical understanding of, you know, someone who represents a group of people with particular behaviors and needs. I know. <laughs> And wouldn't that be a great thing to do first? <laughs> yeah. Okay, but then, and maybe the answer is yes in the end, right? But like, there's this tension where you're trying to get somewhere. Anyway, so go uh, take us further along where you're going. All right, I'll do. Place. I'll do one more, and then I, I think we should take a break. And and I, and Troy just got here, who's also participating in Art Sound Off, uh, Shadowing Tronics, and uh, I'm going to pose this to Troy and to anybody else who's listening in when we take our break, I'm queuing you up with a, a, a question about your experience with Art Sound Up this year is in the second part of this show, we're going to talk about what we hope to achieve, what we hope to gain, what's our objective in this year's Art Sound Up, if we can, if we can articulate it at all. Uh, and that's part of the fun of doing this show is thinking aloud about it. You don't have to have an essay at the ready, but you can start to think about it and maybe throw out, just spitball some ideas and we can react to them. And maybe in our reactions, it will start to take some shape. We'll see. It's fun to live in that ambiguity sometimes. I enjoy it. I love the uncomfortable space of not knowing, you know. 
Um, but before I get there, I'm sorry, Rob, I just like threw out a whole bunch of thoughts before I'm like, no, no, no. But, but to get to the other thought I was going to say before I did these thoughts, this is part of my intellectual tumbling. That <laughs> you just demonstrated what I just talked about. It's awesome. <laughs> Keep going. I did. I totally did. Um, so one of the things that I've been exploring through mine is really um, being explicit about defining or not defining, but describing the chasm of experience between somebody who's never done something and somebody who's done it a little bit. Right. And I think when, so, okay, here's, here's a spoiler. Um, Ann and I just got a piano. Uh, it was gifted to us and, um, I've never played the piano. I've always wanted to play the piano and can play a little bit of piano. I can't play any piano. And so she opens up her children's, like the books that she learned on when she was a child and we're sitting there together. And I'm just trying to get through this idea of my thumbs are both one, my index fingers are both two, middle finger, both three, ring finger, both four, pinky, both five, going in opposite directions. And I'm reading the left hand and the right hand simultaneously on there. And I'm moving at a snail's pace. And Anne's like, well, no, that, that's, you're looking for F sharp. I'm like, I don't even know what an F sharp is. I'm just trying to get used to the fact that my fingers are different numbers going in opposite directions. It's freaking my brain out. You know, I'm not getting all tense about it or anything, but it's like, it's the, this goes to that specificity idea is like, you can't get too specific because for me, I got to get over this whole idea of numbering my fingers <laughs> before I can even think about key before I can even think about like identifying middle C every time. What my thumbs are going to share middle C that's bananas because they're both number. Ah, uh, how am I going to write? So yeah. So I've been doing a lot of defining of that mindset and that perspective taking as a teaching artist, because what's obvious to us, even if we've only been doing this a few years, even, like if you've committed to doing drawings on a regular basis for even two years, you've done so much more work than somebody who's never done it before. Right. And respecting that gulf of experience is fundamental to being a teaching artist in my in my opinion um and respecting that respecting that what does that mean well that means like don't prescribe let them learn the way you learned and you can be the guide to help them make that journey more efficiently or with less anxiety or less ambiguity because you're there to reassure them so anyway yeah that's really awesome. And it is a different style. I mean, because you you are very fundamentally a different uh, teaching artist. If you're someone who has no empathy for other points on skill development, um, where um, you, you, if you're just, hey, we're going to perform at this expert level all the time, and I will constantly tell you you're failing unless one or, you know, some, some part of you or uh, other people in your group end up you know, maybe meeting that it, that's, that's, that's a way to do it. But it's, um, I honestly think that's, that's, um, that's cavalier and callous and it, it's, it's because inherently we are all, I, so I love that approach. And, and I do think that's really powerful in, uh, and I, again, like the, the connections between our topics in like when you're designing something, um, like you really want to include the, collect different po potential different points on the, the the path of skill development right so novices experts people in between and uh think about well how does this speak in and function for anyone in the you know at, at any point because you know experts you don't want them to get bored and you want them to dig deeper and find and meet them where they're at you want to meet novices where they're at and it's okay that they're not experts yet no that's it's um and like good well, uh, I think uh, a good product of any kind, whether it's a learning experience or um, a doorknob or software, whatever, is uh, it has that built into it, that that amount of like thought about how it is for other people. So yeah. I love that. That's and it's it's so much resonance between our topics. What is going on here? <laughs> well, I mean that actually, in retrospect, that's very that's not so so not surprising given that how long we've worked together and what effects we've had on one another as you know teaching artists and in terms of like sharing and articulating our philosophies together. Right? It, it's it shouldn't be too surprising, but mm. uh, but yeah, yeah. Uh, so. 
that's what I've been exploring. I've been really trying to, oh, well, I guess I'll save this for the second half. We talk about what we're hoping to get out of it because like, it's not just pure altruism. I'm also doing my own kind of research and development for maybe not product development, but for other things. Uh, and we'll talk about that. And how about in a minute and a half? How does that sound to you, Rob? That sounds awesome. I think, yes, we've All right. covered a lot of ground here. We're, okay. We've cool. got some, yeah, an ad spot to get to. Uh, yes, we have to thank some people who make this show possible. And those are the people who support us on Patreon. Patreon.com slash Lena Tart is the website. What is it? It's a way for you to give us a monthly upvote. If you believe in Robin Jersey and what we make at LenaTart.com, you could go to Patreon.com slash Lena to Art and you can support us on an ongoing basis for as little as a dollar a month. You also could support us just like on a one-time basis, just like, to, like once a year. Go ahead and do like whatever you think you can, you know, uh, you feel like uh, giving to the show and avail yourself of behind the scenes material. And then, you know, check out at the end of that month, come back next year. But I want to thank five people who have been supporting us on a regular basis. So first, Sarah Lutfi. Thank you, Sarah, for believing in us and what we do. And David Armentrout. Thank you, David. It means a lot to us. And both of you, I've, I've been, uh, you know, interacting with you in the Lena Tart Discord, which has been super fun. Dado. Thank you, Dado, for believing in us and what we do. You can find Dado on Twitter at Dadotronic. And Sophie Lawson, thank you, Sophie. And you can find Sophie on Twitter at Sophie Lawson Art. And J.S. Taskus, you can find J.S. Taskus on Twitter. Get this, J.S. Taskus. Easy to remember. We'll all be linked in the show notes, too. And you can join them all at lenatwart.com slash Patreon or patreon.com slash lenatwart, where you'll find all the shows we make, as well as the extra leans, the shows we record only for people who support us on Patreon. Those posts become an open mic thread where you can talk about whatever you want in a safe space with fellow leaners and also get you access to the Discord, which we'll talk about in the you know second ad break uh, ad spot patreon.com slash lena tart thanks to everybody who supports us there it means a lot mm -hmm. thank you so much okay uh well we gotta do another music stinger to indicate oh there we go all right so now we're pumped to talk about like uh, what outcomes are we hoping for? I, I love this. I love how you framed it up as an outcome, which um, can mean a lot of different things. I mean, an outcome doesn't have to be something where it's like, oh, it means that I make this much more money a year or it means I get this much more attention for my work. Could, but it doesn't have to be specifically like that kind of like personal benefit. An outcome can mean a lot of things. But um I, I have a feeling that we're not just doing this just for the sake of doing it or doing it just because we have nothing but love in our hearts for the world. Although that's a big part of it. Um. <laughs> yeah. I mean, th there's a, I mean, we're, we're sharing this publicly, right? There's a, it's possible to have value in, and to really value what you do and still do some aspect of giving it away. And um, that's, you know, for we for instance this podcast um and uh, yeah that is that's interesting that you so you mentioned that um is there a uh, is there any kind of like tension or friction as far as the the giving it away cuz uh like your your essays are incredibly polished like you could probably go straight to a lot of things with your essays um uh, it's so, I mean, I think they they have a lot of inherent value. Are you are you thinking like, uh oh, I'm I'm putting money on the table and just walking away? Or? No, because um, one of the things that I think I'm doing is I'm creating a um, a trail of evidence of my expertise as a, a professional development uh, workshop leader. Um, the the money is not bad for doing that, and when we're on the other side of this pandemic, knock on wood. Um, I wouldn't be against doing more traveling to do professional development, like going to places and working with teachers. Um, I find that work incredibly um, uh, enriching for me. I think it's valuable work and it's meaningful work because um, if you think about it, if I'm working with 12 teachers, each of those 12 teachers is going to be working with 30 or more students. They're going to be working with those students over a number of years. There's a cascading effect that there's like an amplification of the work that can happen when you do that that is cool and as somebody who's like super not that interested in having his name be like 
copyright Jersey Droz and every one of those pieces of the cascading effect. I just want the positive effect, but I want to be compensated in a way that I can continue doing the work. Um, that's like, it, it pushes all my buttons. It, it flips every switch for me. So having polished and I think well-articulated thoughts on this idea um, serves as a pretty decent discoverable advertisement for my ability as a teaching artist. And it's something I could put on my teaching website to say like, here's like, hire me to talk to your teachers. Here's some topics I could talk about. Here's like a bunch of five minute essays you can listen to about how I think about this stuff to hear my presence. Right. Um, and yes, it is a, a self-contained thought that people could just say like, thank you. I got what I need. And if they did great, but it ain't going to replace the rich, richness of having me in the room to work with the teachers where they're at. Right. So I just did a pro professional development session very recently where, uh, we discovered one of the teachers had synesthesia and like it just came out through the interaction of like when I was doing shape, size, line, and color. And they're like, oh, well, the circle's friendly and it's orange. I'm like, it's not orange, it's black. I'm like, aha, do we have synesthesia here? And they're like, well, maybe. And I'm like, okay, let's talk about that. Let's talk about how comics represents the world of five senses with only one sense. And you with synesthesia, like you have like an extra superpower in that realm, you know? And they wrote me afterwards and were like, I have never had my special way of looking at things honored in that way in a room by like even in college like thank you like you've made me really excited about this and, and incorporating it into my classrooms and like using that superpower for good right like okay well a podcast can't do that right so <laughs> anyway what about you <laughs> what <laughs> I love this. This is getting you talking on on just the 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 topic of being a teaching artist is the best accident of this year. Um, it's because yeah, because the world needs this. Like what you're doing, the world needs this. And I, and I'm oh, that's very kind of you to say. It. That is very kind of you to say, Rob. Um. So let's see. Um. I. What am I doing with this? It's uh, every every place I've gone to consult, no matter what inherent rank my role has been, because of how I engage with everyone, I end up practicing and spreading a method. Not because I'm, you know, prescribing and you know pushing like this, this uh, anything other than being inquisitive in a in a repeatable systemic way with you know interviewing and understanding the people around me and the audience that we're serving and it just has an effect right where um i'm trying to take that and distill it better it's been in my workshops it's been in 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 all the in in the podcasts it's been in, in a lot of places but like um one of the ways of, of spreading that is, is, is focusing on the tools of user experience and saying, well, I know that, um, I can help no matter what method and things everyone, like people subscribe to in their, in an organization, there's like something that I've, I've, I reconcile is, is, uh, in my career, user experience design and agile development have, are, are both conflated and, and grew along their own timelines in the last, if I'm honest, I've been, you know, sometimes I, I hide my age just slightly. I don't know if I can do it great, but I'll say like, I've been doing this 15 years. I've actually been doing this longer. <laughs> um, you know, like I was, I was teaching like, um, like uh, fundamentals of, uh, of, well, human centered design and uh, creating an effective web presence in like 1998. So add that up, I guess. <laughs> it's been a while. And then it was, you know, ebbs and flows as far as would I have a lot of teaching in my day to day in my, in my career and, and you know, what, where I was at anyway. Um, like the tools that of like thinking of people more, it just gets us past so much that gets baked into roles and the theory of, of how organizations grow and are supposed to be doing something better, but they've only made better, um, through an idea of efficient efficiency which excludes people oftentimes so i'm here to hack that i'm here to say nope we can do better include that i'm not i'm not here to say get rid of it because you know what thinking and trying to do better through efficiency motivation heck great 
channel that energy towards something that helps humans. Fantastic. Um, and I've done it over and over and over. And I know I can help other people do it too, because I affect the people around me that I work with. And I've, I've taught this stuff. So like, I'm trying to get that out of me in a way that is a sh better shareable thing that, uh, anyway, so I mean, that's the, that's the essence of what I'm trying to do. And I'm, I'm, I'm working to do it in, in, in a sustainable trade, right? Where um, I want to encapsulate that in a few different forms that uh, would be both pre-performed and download and use at your own you know, pace. This is probably eventually going to become a book, I, I would imagine. But along the way, it's going to be workshops and podcasts and uh, pre-recorded workshops and, and um, live ones, both virtual and in person. And that's, I'm doing this as product development and in a way trying to um, codify stuff that I've practiced and experienced that I've found so useful. And I want others to have this benefit too. And, uh, and it's, and it's, 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 it's hard. And I like the effect that it's having on me by digging into this. Mm. Um, I wish it were easier though. <laughs> I really do. Like it's, you know, when you've been doing something for so long and you think, well, why was this call? And, and I'm not saying I've been every collaboration I'm in is successful. And every time we've always included the audience perfectly. Nope. Screwed it up tons. Yep. And I want to, you know, tell an honest, uh, you know, honest, you know, narrative that, that gives context for these tools and make it, you know, focused on, you know, sharing the, the, the benefits by sharing the tools of, you know, yes, thinking user centered, but also systemic and also, and how that, that is a, that, that's a, a, that's a really powerful thing because you can't just do it to, for one group because you've, it's broken. If you, you literally live a broken, confusing, awful experience. If you say, I'm only going to think of the audience and only do things for them. And all this other dysfunction will come in as far as um, the organization you work for, the team you work with, whatever. So just include them. Start out with that. And, and include uh, you, anyway. right? Like that's Absolutely. Yeah. Gosh, I screwed that up. Like I spent uh, like a decent chunk of my career in the early, early years. Uh, well, that's a whole separate topic. But like in, in an industry that I really, I should have moved on. Um, mm. So... Anyway, well, I should move sooner. And and also building on this idea of including you is, I think, this idea of um, when I go back to my first Thunder Punch Daily for this year, when I was talking myself out of doing something, I was like, I I was starting with the assumption that I have nothing to offer because I'm not famous. I only have a few books up behind me. I've only been doing this a few years, right? Whoa, wait, 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 wait. You had at that point, Jersey your first mini series in publication, you had drawn hundreds of pages at that point. Yes. You'd only been doing it a few years and you would only just started to get kind of good at that stuff at that point. Right. But the chasm of experience between where you were then and somebody who has never drawn a comic before was massive. Respect that, right. Bring yourself into it at least like in that way. Um, but, but don't bring yourself into it that way that when somebody in the group acts out, you take it personally. Like, why aren't you giving me all the respect that I am supposed to get by showing up to this thing? <laughs> why are you being a, a complicated and funny human being with all sorts of motivations that I'm not aware of because I've only met you for the first time in this moment. <laughs> so, um, but no, I think that's awesome, Rob. And I, yeah, you're right. It's like uh, this parsing through this stuff and um, articulating it in a way and going through these different like drafts, it, in, especially on this like sort of, I feel like the challenge is both good and bad in that way. Because the challenge is saying like, you got to have a drum beat. And so you got to ship something today. Do it today, which, which forces your hand and makes you show up and do the work of working on the draft. But also it's like, there are times where I'm like, I wish I would have had a little bit more time to think about that. And, you know, so like part of the narrative I'm trying to give myself this month is I know there were some in the series I've done so far where I'm like, I didn't explore it as thoughtfully as I could have. I can always revisit it. I've got 30 days, you know, 
I'll, if, if it really haunts me, I'll revisit it and I'll just come back and do like a part two on it. So, yeah, that's, um, it, it's been interesting too, for me with this because, um, I I've opened that can of worms every time. And I, it, it, there, there are, and it's just a matter of like how, how good and useful is this rough draft? And I think I've done okay, but I've also paced myself and I've also done some of these drafts are actually like second or third drafts that I, that I put out there. So there's, there's that. Um, <laughs> We're here again where Rob, you've described this in the past where there are an inordinate amount of polytechnic casts that like never got posted. Yeah. And it just gets, it, the, it, the list grow, grows and grows. Um, and I somehow thought I added to this. So I begun this challenge in a, with using my own, uh, well, my workshop, uh, you know, customizing your next creative challenge. And I, I, there's a workbook in there and I went through it and I'm like, okay, this is what I, I, I want to get focused and help, you know, establish what's the, what am I trying to do with this drum beat and all that? And I thought I was going to do more video. And, but I had a good idea that because of a variety of things, I'm probably not doing 30 this, mm. this time around, I'm probably doing five to 10 and I've, I've done like 12 and, but I do think I, I have, have more, but I've only been able to do 12 because I stopped trying to do video because the, the, the process of doing the video for me with where I'm at and how I want to make use of that, that, um, form of expression. Mm -hmm it was stopping me from, from even doing the rough draft. Yeah. So I, I stepped back and I'm like, okay, audio podcasts, keep going. Like, yeah. this is a, not a good sign to, to be blocked with that. So. No, no. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. We, uh, with the, with this project that we're doing right here, we found ways to make it efficient and be able to do something that's relatively thoughtful with video, but like to do something like with like really thoughtful video production. Yeah, that, that's, that's real work, man. Um, and you're right. It's, it's tough to do drafts this way. Um, so, I mean, it, well, I'm telling you as somebody who's like just finished a, a comics festival where there were some video events where we we're like, we'll edit it afterwards. This, we're just going to get minimum viable product out the door here, but we'll edit it down. I'm in the process of editing those videos now. And I'm like, Oh, I wish I didn't say that. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, future me yeah. is, is kicking past me in the butt. Um, let's do you want to do some of the comments? Uh, we begin some comments from, okay. uh, so Troy chimes in says, uh, well, Oh, <laughs> practical issue. Somebody who's also Troy is doing video. says, I'd like to get through the rest of the month without the webcam screen up again. Yeah. Uh, that's the other thing about having a drum beat is like, you gotta have like reliable and resilient, equipment um but then he says usually i go into this as a creator fan and critic this year i'm also trying to get my creative energies back up and experiment with a few programs and techniques so that's cool bringing experimentation into it in a sense of like exploration and he said plus i'd like to learn a few things from the other participants bingo that's awesome um i love that the that's the whole idea of inviting other people to play along is to look at the different approaches and see if there's anything we can mine from one another's uh you know approach or worldview on these things um mm -hmm. matt zolman showed up and said uh, i'm all about creative count accountability moving forward and creating my current personal project building a close group of trusted advisor mentors and produce review and iterate from quality feedback uh matt I i'm wondering if matt's talking about art sound off or just like art in general with that but i could see how art sound off would be applicable to that in terms of putting your voice out there and your thoughts and your perspective and your worldview out there to attract the, the kind of peers who resonate with your approach to things, which is. Yeah. The, it's um, you may get some of that incidentally through things. The community is uh, exploring and thinking about um, in art sound off, but then to, yeah, like you were saying, like maybe this is a step toward like constructing that because that sounds a lot like a brain trust or, some kind of you know peer mentoring or some kind of uh, formal arrangement where uh, art sound off is is less formal in that way collectively. Yeah. There yeah. isn't like a, an explicit uh, like matchmaking and mutual uh, critiquing kind of thing. Right. Right. Interesting idea. 
It is an interesting idea. Um, and I mean, I would also say like, that's where Matt, if you find yourself resonating with um, the kinds of thoughts that we explore on Lean Into Art, the Lean Into Art Discord, which we'll talk about shortly, is a place where you could also go to find some more of those like-minded people. Um, really supportive group there in terms of sharing each other's work and you know building each other up, not tearing each other down. So um, uh, any other thoughts that we have on like what, uh, in terms of, objectives or outcomes like what outcomes we're looking for with this um i know that i do have an explicit hope that through sharing my thoughts on this whole gig of being a teaching artist that i can encourage more people to try it um because it is a pretty like if 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 you enjoy it it is a great way to create an extra revenue stream as an artist and I think this is something I've been thinking about a lot about this idea of portfolio careers as, as introduced to me by Elaine Grogan Lutrow of Minerva Financial Arts. Um, this is the idea of like, if you can't count on any one thing to be your bread and butter because even the most regular recurring gig, we live in a world where there's all sorts of uncertainty. So having multiple ways to make your income as an artist is a good thing. Um, and what a great way to have an extra revenue stream in the sense of like, oh yeah, I also empower people to like love this stuff the way I love it. You know, <laughs> and that I get money. <laughs> so, but at the same it time, is, yeah. It's another way, like mm -hmm. you've built this, uh, you've built, you're building another fluency that may not be like out of reach for you, especially if you practice it in low risk ways and start to build it up. As, yeah. and, and all of a sudden now you've, you, you have your, um, I mean, that's how, I mean, so many gigs, so many things that we do, it's like you're, you're brought in and you're hired for a specific skill or capability, but then like really bringing it to use, there's a bigger, there's a wider circumstance around that. So yeah, you're hired as a, a programmer, but now you've got to talk to people. You're hired as a, a designer, um, a, you know, visual designer, but now you've, you need to go do some research or what, you know, there's always that extra stuff and um like the teaching artist thing is i think that's just an awesome um natural uh like it's it's pretty close because it to you know if you're doing things like uh you're you know you're consulting and you're you're bidding and you're doing you're doing a lot of stuff that helps you convey the value of what you do and i mean you're you're taking steps along that that make you more ready to potentially teach about what you do mm -hmm. um it's it's possible and especially when you you're finding the small you know teaching and practicing it, it without you're, you're not saying like well step one this i mean you know this is the classic mistake of of like falling in love with an idea and saying well hey i love comics i'm gonna make a 500 page graphic novel <laughs> as my first project perfect comparison so, yes yes make many you can comics. do that with the teaching thing too like you, you don't have to like, do the well, tedx talk to start out with right <laughs> no way it doesn't have to be a 12-week course and it doesn't have to, yeah tedx talk perfect uh it's sure that's a one one-time performance but that's a heck of a <laughs> yeah. performance to, to yeah do, so. yeah that that's a big ass no okay so um so i'm, I'm curious you just you defined like four specific constituencies that you want to introduce UX mindset to business people, software engineering people, designers, and artists. Can you clearly uh, explain like what outcomes you hope for them in particular? Um, well, I think for them as individuals and groups in their collaborations, um, I, I wish for them to have healthier, more inclusive collaboration. Um, and that's, uh, you know, collaborating, collaborating out of a sense of understanding instead of, um, you know, compromise. <laughs> and yeah, yeah, it, right. I mean, it's possible to, to, um, understand the, the audience, it, you know, you may, you may be, a, um, in, in any case. So th this is one of the, one thing where, um, data comes from all kinds of places. So like, you know, one of one of this um, my behind the scenes essays I've, I've I did is because of um, honestly uh, being being passed up for for a job opportunity, and I'm like, well, and it's because of my rate in this in that case, and I'm like, why would they 
this organization have a problem with the the rate or whatever and i and i thought it's just about valuing design you know it's about the value of a different way of looking at the world and saying one way i can mitigate risk is pay less for it even though the value it brings to, to my business is immense but i'm not fluent enough yet in the space to have made that what I, what seems to me is is a big leap and i thought um there's something in this um in this space of like so artists of course you're going to value the thing that may, feels real really rewarding and that you get you know internally rewarded for because it feels good to to make what you make and then feels good to get paid for it as well but then um there's there's always a bigger you know system around it where like as an artist you may have ideas for new kinds of new new kinds of products new ways of of putting your service into the, into the world and i know user centered design that is systemic mind is is going to help you pull that off i know it's going to help engineers and software developers um do better things for each other and maybe even honestly evolve some different quirks and movements and stuff that go on in that space that in my opinion because of um a little bit of mythology right like that's a whole separate topic that like like the idea that you you can't framework away humanity in fact you create a lot of problems when you do that so yes automation big thumbs up and also include humanity along the way and so i know a lot of engineers and especially people who start to lead engineering teams they get into the situation where they they haven't haven't um haven't practiced enough of the skills for um both collaborating within and and collaborating outside so i know it's going to make an impact for them huge impact because there's there's so you know there's so much software in the world um and on and on so in business as well too so like you can you you can do a lot by just saying i've got the funding i've got the funding i can i can make the space to to make a thing happen and now i i bring together the people to to execute on my vision but then so if you have your ability the you're empowered because of your funding but and 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 you've brought in the talent to act upon your vision and you're not doing it in a you know human centered systemic minded way um you're you're missing out on a lot of possibility of of um making more meaningful products and honestly having just more sustainability with your teams and how they work together and all that so um right every audience i think has a has a huge stake and and a um a lot on the line when it comes to being human centered and it's not ever present right so i see the need for it um so i, I and i i know i can help because i've connected with all these different audiences and uh and each one of them it's the same skills and tools but then but but there's a little twist on the impact specifically for them i've worked in a lot of places where very few of the people feel appreciated or or even like that their that their work is going noticed and then i've worked in places or worked with teams where everybody feels like not only is their work getting noticed but like it matters to the organization as a whole and that intrinsic motivation changes dramatically between those two states like if you feel like you're toiling in relative obscurity there's there's very little intrinsic or extrinsic reward in doing a really like putting your best effort or even sharing like a perspective that might help solve a problem like what's the use that nobody nobody's listening anyway so mm. I guess I'm just a piece it's of this so machine. Yeah, it's it's a very bleak way to. to and, and I mean, like, I worked in creative industries that do this, right? I worked at a newspaper in an ad design department. Now I know it's ad design, and we we're designing things for a circular, so it wasn't like we weren't, you know, Mozart in here, <laughs> right? We're designing pizza ads, <laughs> but there was we had to solve creative problems all the time. But like, there was this overall sense that this doesn't matter. We're just cranking out ads, just get the stuff done, and like, it was a very the morale was very low all the time. And then I've, again, I've worked with pl places where it's like, we're building something together and everybody's contribution matters. And the kind of thinking and work that you get is so of such a higher quality. Um, and the experience of being around that environment is so much richer, you know? So, but 
it's there's all this untapped potential as far as uh, really everyone bringing in their whole self and yeah. uh, really being able to um, participate and collaborate, have a shared purpose. And, uh, and I've experienced that over and over. I've helped found teams and, and I've helped, like, I've also just been in the role, role of being added to teams and, uh, and have, have seen these, these kinds of principles play out. And I've been in environments that are bleak, like what you described with clients that have, um, where part of my work, part of the understanding was just, it was, it was doing as much research inside the organization to get people's voices out and then find the common ground as it was outside the org. Um, so, uh, in, in the, where the voices weren't connecting because of, you know, trust breaks down, it's this team and our team and they suck and we're great. And I don't know, um, you know, I don't, it, that stuff where we are quirky, quirky beings. I forget what you said uh, earlier on, but like, you know, as humans, we, we do some, we do some odd stuff. And, um, you know, you throw in the, like business on top of that, you throw in art on top of that you, in other cultures, engineering, design itself. Um, I, uh, I love my design community and, but, and, but it all, and they also remind me of um, experiences <laughs> with uh, like <coughs> studying, like, like studying guitar. Like when someone finds out that like, Oh, you, you know, you know, guitar, you, oh, oh, really? Well, um, yeah. Can you play eruption? Do you know the, the D mixolydian mode and this? I'm like, no, I don't, I don't know what you're talking about, but I can make some sounds. And they're like, well, you're not really a guitarist, man. And I'm like, yeah. well, and so designers could do that too. Cause they love this stuff. And they're like working out in the design gym so yeah. hard. And, yeah. and, and in some ways losing their ability to connect and make valuable things happen with their own skill because there's, there's just, they're so pumped up on like, you know what? Wireframes aren't the thing anymore. You're <laughs> dumb if you do it that way or, or like picking like human centered design. Well, you know <laughs> what happens if you think about people only the world falls <laughs> apart and it's like, well, yeah. Uh, okay. you got a lot of great ideas. Yeah. Yeah. This was <laughs> and a, also yeah. Anybody who's enjoying this needs to go download Rob's episode called Misunderstanding and Misuse of UX's Power because he went into this and I thought it was great. <laughs> and I totally agree. Comics has the exact same problem where people argue over you don't stack panels this way, you stack them that way. You don't do word balloons this way, you do them that way. And anybody who does it wrong is 10 Hitlers stacked on top of each other running at you, you know? <laughs> So it, 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 it's, it's, it's you, because you care, you love this thing so much and you focus on it so much. Yes. You can, you can like disconnect from, you know, the fact that new discoveries can happen from everywhere. And maybe this, this, this interconnecting, this is a good thing. And maybe you don't have the bandwidth to understand it. Right. Like, so like TikTok, I'm going to be a total old guy just for a second. And, and I'm actually, I'm enjoying some of these kind of old people conversations I've been having with my wife. We're like, we're both talking about TikTok like that. They might be giants track. We're like, how do they make any money off this? It don't make no sense. You know, it, it's like, it's people going like this all the time to music, right? Like, I, I know it's more than that. I know it's, there's something <laughs> profound about it that I just don't have the bandwidth and the time to really investigate right now. I, I am interested and I believe that there's something to it, but right now, all I've got is that per that picture in my head, but I'm not going to go on Twitter and be like, what's this TikTok all about? You know, <laughs> it's like, it goes back to something <laughs> that uh, Conan O'Brien said. He's like, he's like, wait, like, uh, you know, uh, on the Munsters, I guess, like it, when the Beatles came to America, like they made fun of the Beatles. Like what's with these Beatles? Everybody's all excited about, you know, and just, like, oh, it turns out they're kind of a big deal. You know, you don't want to be that guy, but it, it part, part not because history is going to laugh at you, but because although if that's a motivation, sure, <laughs> go, go for it. But to, to remind <laughs> constructive shame, <laughs> <laughs> but but like this idea of like just understanding that like there's different people coming at this thing from different places, and that they might have something to offer, and that if if you're confused, maybe it's a signal that you got to reconnect and dig deeper. Anyway. Yeah, absolutely. That's, that's, uh, uh, that, that feeling of, of, yeah, spreading that, that kind of, uh, curiosity and it's not, not everything's for everybody and that's okay. Yeah. Um, so anyway, I, um, this is, uh, 
yeah, I think we I think we dug really pretty deep into this. I think we did, and probably could did. continue on. Yeah, um, okay. <laughs> because I mean, there's always like, you know, how do you come up with this? And like, that's a classic question of like, where do you get these ideas? Oh, and, yeah, uh, yeah. How do we that get kind of thing? Maybe yeah. that's a good closing question. Okay. Um, or we could leave. Well, I don't know. Well, we got to talk about two minute or yeah, two minute practice. But yeah, um, I mean, yeah, true that. I guess like we both in our series did a little bit of talking about perspective taking, and that's something we practice a lot. And um, I think perspective taking is a useful tool, not only for if you're going to be teaching artists or if you're going to be a designer, but like if you're trying to do an art sound off uh, essay and you say something like, OK, so let's take one of Troy's, for example. Troy did this episode that I responded to about shared universes, and it was just him thinking aloud about like, uh, you know, like, does everybody have to do this? Like it, it, just because one person did it or like one company did it and it was really successful. It seems like everybody's like running at it right now. and I, as a consumer, don't think that that's the, the the beginning and end of making a product exciting, right? And he started to think about like his perspective as a consumer, but then he was also sort of trying to ruminate on like, well, what are they thinking when they're doing this thing? That that is perspective taking, right? Is like thinking about what what are they probably after here, based on what I see, based on what signals they give me. What kind of picture can I put together of like what their their motivation is, why they're doing this? Um, so one of the things that I'm thinking about when I'm doing my teaching artist essays is like, what parts of this would be absolutely invisible to somebody who's never done it before. Um, what would be something that would that I remember frightening me about this when I was first starting out? What is something that I thought, gosh, this isn't what I asked for when I took on the job? And how did I learn that that's actually deeply connected to the job? Um, mining my own experience and making inferences based on uh, data that I've seen in interacting with other people. Uh, what kind of perspectives can I take to bring people closer to this thing that I find a lot of value in? Um, does that make sense? It does. It makes a lot of sense. I mean, that's a very repeatable process. You can pick anything that you think is is useful or you care a lot about and you're like, hey, this is useful. Um, basically, que uh, question, have attention, question, unpack, clarify. Uh, like roughly something like that could be like just starting out a hit record and ask yourself a question <laughs> and then you probably will end up if you follow that flow you'll get some kind of uh, result and um, I, I think something that you and I do very naturally th at this point maybe we worked on it I can't remember but we don't do we don't tell stories about ourselves about how we arrived at a conclusion we tell stories about where we grappled with a problem um and I think that there's like a, a popular or a kind of storytelling that I, I encounter a lot where somebody's like, and then the solution revealed itself to me. And like, that was such an attractive idea. I was like, I can't wait for that to happen to me. And like, it never happened that way. Like the, 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 the solution was like a slow revelation of little mini observations that kind of like begin to gel. And there's never even a point where they click. There's never any point where it's like, click. Now it's a picture. Oh, I see it now. It's more like, I think, I think, I think, I think, I think. I think it's that. I think it's that. I think it's that. Oh, okay. I think it's this now. And it might not be this later, but this is the shape that I see right now. And this is how it scared me when I first started to think about it. You know, I mean, you might have a eureka moment in there somewhere, but like that's a that's like this tiny piece of like, oh, wait a minute. I just clarified this idea <laughs> better. Yeah. Awesome. And it's still, it's just one idea in a sea of stuff. And you're like, well, now I, it's not like you, you now have a, uh, I don't know, like a get rich quick YouTube thing ready to go. <laughs> well, and, um, yeah. And the other thing is I would, I would underline is that both you and I, I think are very comfortable with sitting with awkward ideas and awkward moments. Um, and that's a big part, at least speaking as a te teaching artist, that's a big part of my classroom experience is like walking around go, walking around the room literally saying like i don't know what do you guys think that's a weird idea why are you saying weird things to me let's 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 figure this out you know and like being okay with that you know because that's that's where the excitement is that's where the gold is is in those moments it's not in me going like and this is the way you do a nine panel grid check please you know <laughs> so yeah yeah that that's true so like the having a bias toward hunting for questions yeah that let you d do your own discovery process is uh definitely common ground for us um <laughs> uh, but yes yeah. I, I, so, think we, I think we dug okay. around it
and, and I and I just I, I'm so grateful for the way you clarify my almost pictorial explanations of ideas. <laughs> I, I feel like I'm on the slow path to becoming those characters in Star Trek who speak entirely in metaphor. Um, <laughs> and, I don't know about that because I'm a I, I'm a awkward moment like wave pool. I, I'm a I'm a generator of awkward moments, and you surf those things like like you know like a pro. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate that. Oh, well. I, I, yeah, this was a fun one and I'm really, I'm grateful for everybody who showed up for the live stream to interact with us uh, and, and share their experiences with Art Sound Off. There's still, you know, much of the month left. So Art Sound Off hashtag, if you feel like diving in and trying it out a little bit, it's at artsoundoff.com um, or leanintoart.com slash artsoundoff or I'll pull up on the screen right now so you can see there's prompts there that you can play along with if you want some structure to it, but you could also just dive in and just, you know, Think about what objectives and outcomes you want to experience through audio journaling. So it's it is a really approachable challenge, and it's it doesn't have to be shared publicly. And uh, I think we set you up with here's some food for thought for a lot of different tools and ways where you can go about it. That may remind you of like, oh wait a minute, I've got this cool app. I want to, and and, uh, and then the prompts are are there. And one thing I've been saying a lot this year is that November is when we celebrate Art Sound Off, mm. but maybe. You, you know, you, you time shift that in, in a way that works. Oh, I love it. I love letting them take ownership of it on their terms. That's the best. That is the best. Okay. Well, do you want to now talk about uh, the two minute practice? Ah, oh, two minute practice. Hey, Jersey. Hey, Rob. <laughs> it's time for the two uh, minute practice. We've been practicing. Yeah. Uh, practice is different than a challenge. It is. I often say the challenge word, though, yeah. because I think I do feel tension with this practice of saying, well, I'm going to frequently do this, you know, two minute thing, set a timer and try something out um, and then, you know, keep repeating that for seven days, 14 days, what have you, uh, because and it's in it, even though it's two minutes, it's still a thing. It's, it's not whatever I was doing. It's not whatever the, you know, my, my main tasks, the projects I'm, I'm working on. It's not an administ it's a, it's a kind of administrative, administrative thing, I guess. It's like, Hey, I'm going to invest in some, um, you know, this, this odd idea of I could take two minutes. It I, I waste two minutes all, all the time, you know, like, like I could just purposefully have two minutes to practice a thing and um and so what were we practicing this time around jersey well if, if memory serves uh and it better because otherwise i've been doing it wrong this last two weeks is we've been doing stretches taking two minutes to stop have a purposeful pause and stretch our bodies um and i've been doing mm, yes. a lot of arm stretching um as yeah. i've been doing a lot of typing and writing and drawing this last two weeks so how did, how did you... repetitive stress? I mean, that's, that's its own, like naturally, um, I mean, you, you become aware of, of like needing to stretch, yeah. uh, from, from just using these, these tools and surprising. Um, and you mentioned that you have a, an ergonomic mouse, right? Oh, yes. Which is, which is yes. helping you out. Yeah. And, um, this, uh, I mean, we're not, you know, what is it? Uh, the, the sports doctor, the, kinesiologist um hmm. i don't know i, I don't know you kinesthesiologist yeah Kines uh, yeah uh, or uh kinetics anyway the um there's so we're not you know we're experienced in doing stuff that gets gets us uh <laughs> some repetitive stress mm -hmm. <laughs> and, yes and yeah. you know dabbling like i know like each of us has has a few different stretches and stuff but we didn't prescribe a stretch we're just like hey you know, you're, you make R2. This is a practice to consider. And both of us said, okay, let's, let's give this a try. Do, how did it work, go for you? Um, your stretches, do you have any particular So I actually used, uh, a, a dear friend of mine bought me this book, uh, Creota Wilberg's Draw Stronger, Self-Care for Cartoonists and Visual Artists. And nice. I used stretches in that book uh, to, for, for my practice. Um, we could link to it, but um and so it's it a lot of the arm stretches that she does where, um, you know, taking your arm, holding it out straight and then bending your fingers back towards your face just gently for a few seconds at a time. 
hands down. And this is one that I leave with my students all the time where you keep the elbow locked and then you pull your knuckles towards with your palm towards your face. Um, just to stretch some of your forearm muscles because that's where I get the most pain. I've actually solved a lot of my back problems because I have a um, I don't, I back problems. I talk like I got like a, oh my lumbago. I don't actually have back problems, but I would have some stiffness in my back every once in a while from a long day of working. But I got an, uh, a new kneeling chair. You know, I actually had a kneeling chair for a long time before I moved to Columbus. Threw my old one out, and then when it came time to get a new chair, I'm like, nah, I. I I need to get that back again because it just it helps me sit straighter. I'm not hunching as much when I'm working. Um, so I got my kneeling chair. I've got my ergonomic mouse. And then so like the real issues I was having were in my forearms from a lot of, you know, repetitive motion with my hand drawing. And then a lot, I've been doing a lot of typing. So, um, you know, the stretching, I feel like it's something I should have as a habit anyway. Um, but I, again, I think the, the low pressure, low emotional cost, purposeful pause was incredibly useful in terms of, um, well, how do I phrase this? Um, there's emotional flooding is I think the term is like what can happen when you're experiencing a lot of stress and when you and your partner are expressing a lot of stress and you can flood each other and finding a way to hold that center when the emotions happen to say like, oh, this is a big feeling I'm feeling and then letting it go. That's not the easiest thing in the world. And showing up in an emotionally flooded state is not, I've never been successful at doing a good job <laughs> operating in that state. So having that pause, I, I think I got more as much benefit physically as I did, or I got as much benefit mentally as I did physically, because that two minutes gave me a moment to say, all right, you're doing the practice. I know you got to get that email done. I know you want this out of your hair and you want to stop thinking about it, but you're going to stop thinking about it right now. And you're going to just stretch for a little while. And then you're going to come back to it. You're going to have a little bit more, um, I don't know, resiliency or a little bit more energy in the tank to deal with it. So that's what I got. What about you? I noticed similar things that, uh, and, and, and I, I didn't really characterize it until hearing how you're, you were, uh, experiencing this where the practices that, that are not about output do have a really relaxing, um, impact that it's not like, um, it's, it's not only, it's only two minutes. It's not a vacation, but like it, it gives a little bit of, um, in interruption in, in, in space and saying, I, I get this two minutes to, to not be, um, feeling the pressures of productivity and whatever that they are, right? Mm -hmm. Create, you know, any kind of creative thing. It, it's awesome. I love it. But at the same time, it's not just breathing for two minutes. And I, there's something like the stretching wasn't um, strenuous enough to be its own distraction. So it was just kind of sitting there, breathing my own thoughts, wandering wherever they wander. And uh, that's a pretty neat, like that pause might be, I, I'm not, I guess that's might be one of my favorite practices, <laughs> even though like, it's like the two, the extreme, it's like um, sometimes drawing something really big and making a lot of messy lines and stuff. That's great because that's like the speed metal practice, but then the, then the yoga <laughs> that are the, the meditative practice is like this other side of, huh? What a neat experience that I wasn't getting out of what I was doing. So yeah. it's, yeah, it's living up to its job. Oh yeah. I also did this thing. Let's, um, I don't know if this will work, but if I do, um, I'm sorry, I'm going to risk this. Sorry for everyone who has uh, Apple products. Um, hey Siri, two minute practice. What did it say? Three, two, one. Whoa. You made that a routine on your phone? The two minute practice music <laughs> yeah. that you made? That's the one that I use. But I don't, uh, I don't have it set up as a routine though. Yeah, it's, it's, it's kind of neat to be able to like, I like that timer also, not just because I created it, but it has this little bit of um, like 10 second lead in. Mm -hmm. So I have a, 
it's like I can set myself or what have you of, you know, so, so it's, it's also like, if you start a timer, you go, you start the timer and it's going before you're doing the task or what have you. Right. This one is like, okay, going to begin. <laughs> you have, you have that like, okay, now engage with that practice, pick up the pen, what have you. And anyway, yeah, made it a, um, so I, um, and iOS, it worked for me to make that a, um, things are available for Siri if you turn them into uh, workflows or where now it's called shortcuts. Mm. So yeah, I made a shortcut that um, action that does uh, just plays the two minute practice. Mm. So I bet there are ways to do that on other, other platforms as well. Um, oh yeah, but, I think so. Uh, yeah. But with- actually guaranteed come to think of it. Cause I have played around with the, uh, the Google assistant. Uh, I bet that could do it too. Yeah, yeah. That that's why I called it a routine. I think that's what Google Assistant calls it. And you can set up routines like if you give it a certain command. Um yeah, and 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 Troy's in the, the chat says, I wonder if even if uh Cortana on Windows 10 could do it. I wouldn't be surprised. That's worth looking into. Um so that's a good point. Have never dug into what Cortana can do. So mm. that's um yeah. Anyway, <laughs> so that's that was how I was doing my stretch. Uh, so I don't have to dig around for that timer and and start a different timer. Well, no, that, that's I like exa- that timer. I, I I always go into the Lena Tart Discord and do a search for the timer every time, and then I tell myself you really should just download it and just have it someplace to, so you could play it. And I'm like, yeah, I should. And then I finish my two minute practice. I'm like, I'll go back to my next thing I got to do. I'm like, but, <laughs> so yeah, this time I'm gonna download it. I'm gonna see if I can turn it into a Google Assistant routine. That would be really cool. Um, that would make it a lot a lot easier to do because i do like that 10 second countdown for the same reason you mentioned um so okay uh what are we going to do for our next practice Hmm. i was just looking through our archives while we were talking and it looks like we've done you know some drawing ones we did some low cost drawing ones in terms of like drawing a line to define your day or describe your day um, filling up a page with characters, grabbing color palettes. Um, and it's been a while, it, it's been since August of 2020 that we did anything with music. I wonder what we could do Ooh. with music and noise. Oh, let's see. Well, um, we have been really broad brush with that one, right? Because it was just make noise for two minutes. Mm-hmm. Hmm. Um, what would be a twist on that? Uh, make, uh, we could try to say what kind of like make mellow sounds or super ramped up. sound. I don't know. Like I'm mm, thinking of the, mm, I, I got it. I got the it. Extremes. I got, it. I got it. Uh, so building on the idea of like draw a line to represent how the quality of your day, make some noise representing the quality of the day. Oh, that's fun. All right. Uh, that's and really good. That, that's what we're going to do. Uh, but, you know, uh, Troy's in the chat again, and he has his own approach to it. Listen to a song and just let your hand follow along. See if you get a picture or a brush, fancy lines. That's a cool idea, too. Right? That's an, yeah, that is a really cool idea. So, so, but uh, make that a future practice. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, I like the idea of like, of, of, cause especially, you know, we just got a piano and I'm kind of itchy to play with it. <laughs> so I, I, I would like to go up and like, just like say like, okay, I'm going to try to make sounds that feel like what today felt like and see how that changes my relationship with this mysterious instrument. <laughs> I love it. Yeah. The, that's, that is my primary mode of picking up the, any of the instruments around me where I'm just like. This is how I'm feeling. And <laughs> okay. So it's very low emotional cost for you to do this one. <laughs> oh, very low. Yeah. Are, are there are there some online generators like keyboard generators that you people could go to to like be, generate sounds like if they don't have an instrument in their home? Honestly, I would recommend uh sign up for uh band lab. Okay. Because uh you can it's a um you can dial in and instruments in your browser so you can essentially with your your um you know keyboard literal you know uh click clack keyboard not 
actual synthesized keyboard. You can you can just activate sounds. So whether mm. it's drums or um uh or or a synth or what have you. So yeah, band those are yeah, you're on their product page and whatnot. But yeah, bandlab.com, I think. Yep. And um yeah, and so one of those pictures rotating in their banner shows how essentially there's a, a you know a a virtual synth that you can tap into or virtual drums. So you can trigger that stuff just by typing. Neat. And Troy is asking, so we're talking about playing the blues or the happies, depending on how the day goes. <laughs> you oh, know, yeah. it could either be or letting out the fires of hell from the, <laughs> from the pit of your gut through riffing. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, I'm looking forward to trying this one. So we'll see everybody in two weeks on this. So thank you, Rob. Oh, thank you, Jersey. All right. Well, we have once again come to the end of a Lean Into Art cast. Thanks, everybody, for hanging out with us uh, and participating in Art Sound Off. And uh, we record the show weekly on Thursdays at uh, noon Eastern Time, 11 a.m. Central. Stream it live everywhere and then collect it as a podcast at leanintoart.com and patreon.com slash leanintoart. Uh, we'll see you all next week. Until next time, I've been Jersey Drozd of leanintoart.com and Jersey Drozd on Instagram. And I've been Rob Stenzinger of leanintoart.com and Rob Stenzinger places like Instagram. Okay, bye. How about this for the ending? Show notes for this episode can be found at leanintoart.com. You can also follow us on Twitter at the user Lean Into Art, and you can reach us via email at leanintoart at gmail.com. And remember, leaners aren't wieners. Thanks for listening.